Elder Arsenios the Cave Dweller, who lived 1886 to 1983, fellow ascetic of Elder Joseph the Hezekist. First edition, written by Monk Yosef Dionysiates. Dedication. This present work is dedicated to my recently departed ever-memorable elder and his venerable abbot of the Holy Monastery of Dionysiu, Harlambos. Written out of duty, but also deservedly for my elder, who drew his physical and spiritual descent from the lineage of Arsenios, the cave dweller. Therefore, accept, Father of blessed memory, this work as a brief handwritten epitaph by way of immeasurable gratitude. Signed, Monk Yosif Dionysiates. Greeting of His Beatitude Archbishop Chrysostomos. With paternal interest, we welcome the publishing of the book Elder Arsenios the Cave Dweller. The author of this book, Father Joseph Dionysiates, is of Cypriot descent and a monk. He lived more than 30 years on the holy mountain and came into contact with holy people who fulfilled the commandments of the Bible and who were examples of virtue and holiness. One such contemporary holy person was Elder Arsenios, whose life and teachings are presented in this book. Having the conviction that the readers of this book, Elder Arsenios the Cave Dweller, will greatly benefit from it, we extend our blessing for the publication and recommend it to the Christian faithful of our Church. We bestow our paternal blessings on the author, Father Yosif. At the same time, we express our deep appreciation that the proceeds from the sale of this book go to help those young people who have been trapped in the vortex of dependent substances. With prayers to the Lord, sign Chrysostomos, Archbishop, Holy Archdiocese of Cyprus. Preface Experiences of Elder Joseph of Vatopedi I must confess that for Elder Arsenios, the gospel words, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no guile, are relevant. He was naturally straightforward simple, offenseless, meek, obedient, a rare struggler who possessed nothing. For Elder Arsenios, his yes was always yes and his no, no. He never harbored resentment, no matter how he was wronged. He never got angry. He never hurt anyone. He lived obedience with precision. That is why, through obedience and his unwavering faith in his elder, he lived in a way that surpasses the laws of nature. During vigils, he began the night laboring excessively by kneeling thousands of times and then remained standing until morning. He concentrated so much on the prayer and was so absorbed in it that often, although it was time for work, the elder had no intention of detaching himself from the prayer. Then, out of necessity, we would go up to his window and call him. We would see that he was standing, and his spirit was given completely to prayer. Elder, it's time for work. And the elder, coming to himself, answered us with a query, Is it morning already? This elder, despite his simpleness, understood the essence of monastic life. He gave himself totally to obedience and to ascesis, and that's why he succeeded in achieving what he desired. He found prayer inside him. He found God. A monastic who does not have these aims up front has failed. Elder Arsenios was a great and silent worker of virtue. He is a contemporary figure of the holy mountain. May we have his blessing. Introduction Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Hebrews 13 verse 7 I decided to visit the holy mountain of Athos for the first time in 1964. According to divine economy, the first place to extend hospitality to me was the holy monastery of Dionysiu, where I stayed for 20 days with a lay friend of mine, who's currently a hero monk. There the fame of the ever-memorable abbot Gabriel, among many other fathers, was widespread. That amazing abbot used to say that he chose virtuous spiritual fathers from the desert of the holy mountain to assist him in his holy work of spiritual improvement. During that period, 
the monastery had the exceptional honor of being enriched by a spiritual father who was one of the spiritual children of the great Hezekist of our times, yet under Yosef the cave dweller. The spiritual father was called Father Harlambos. Indeed, a compatriot novice monk was assigned to guide us to their ascetic hut of the spiritual father, which was over an hour's distance from the monastery to New Skeet. One spring morning, we set off with my friend and the compatriot novice as our guide. That beautiful journey was among my first impressions that I will never forget. We went along a narrow pathway in a fragrant and blossoming environment with bushes and forest on our left towards the inner side of the mountain. Towards the right was a sheer, sharp cliff stretching out onto the boundless Signit Gulf and the other part of Halkidiki in the background. A short distance later, after a descent, the Holy Monastery of St. Paul could be seen, and directly above it was a white gorge and the whitened peak of Manathos, appearing as a giant from ancient mythology. It was a panoramic view, but the holy summit was hidden like a veil behind white clouds. Shortly after, the tall tower of Nuskeet could be seen. When we came to the first hut, our guide told us, This is the hut of Father Ephrem, who is a spiritual brother of our spiritual father. Do you want to meet him? Of course. We walked inside, and the elder greeted us with kindness. From his few enlightened words, we formed very good spiritual impressions. Another thing that left a mark on me was the behavior of several of his disciples who offered us the traditional treat. They didn't speak, but were continually whispering the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, giving the impression that they lived in another world. Looking out from the window of the cell, we would make out two other huts under the rocky cliff. What are these? This is the hut of our spiritual father. And that little one? Ah, another holy elder lives there, Father Arsenios. Don't be in a hurry. We will see everything. Coming out of the cell, we walked down toward the hut of the spiritual father, Father Harlambos, and saw someone working in the garden. That's him, said the guide. When Father Harlambos saw us, he stopped working, greeted us with a lot of love, and proposed that we go inside the hut. The spiritual father left us with the best impressions. The only thing that remained was to visit the ascetic elder who lived in the opposite hut. From the very first moment, we realized that the peaceful face before us was that of a holy person with many virtues, meekness, love, humility, but he was distinguished principally for his blessed simplicity and guilelessness. That was Elder Arsenios. I was counted worthy to live with that little elder the remaining 18 years of his life. Since the compassion of the Theotokos tore me from the world and included me among the newly formed brotherhood of Father Harlambos. Of course, as Father Arsenios was older, he was considered the elder of the brotherhood. However, the administrative responsibilities rested solely with my spiritual father, Father Harlambos. During recent years, there's been a lot of publicity about many Athenite monks. However, until now, very little has been published about the amazing life of Father Arsenios, especially during his early years, under the enlightened direction of his great contemporary fellow ascetic, Elder Joseph the Cave Dweller. That is why, despite my inability to put pen to paper, my lowly self considered it an overbearing duty to write a few lines about this holy elder, as is the desire of many of his spiritual children. What follows is either from direct conversations with the elder or from people in his immediate surroundings. The present publication can also be considered as a summarized narrative of the journey of two great fellow ascetic fathers, Yosef and Arsenios. It is woven with the journey of their spiritual descendants, with Father Arsenios as the central and main character. I convey the language spoken somewhat freely and the elder's expression with mixed tone because, as is known, the ever-memorable one spoke modern Greek with some difficulty. I express my warmest gratitude to all those who contributed, in whatever way, in order to improve this publication. Part A. 
The Childhood Years of Anastasios, Divine Call. Childhood Years. Elder Arsenios, known in the world as Anastasios Ganapapoulos, the son of Dimitri and Sotiria, would relate to us that his first native homeland was blessed and glorified Pantos. Despite the hard yoke and the oppression inflicted by the Turkish occupier, he managed to remain firm in his Greek Orthodox traditions. Nevertheless, the oppression at times was so intense that the people had to either give up their religious beliefs or immigrate. This is what happened to the family of the then young Anastasios. The unrelenting pressures, lootings, nightly assaults, and so on forced his large family, like many other compatriots, to emigrate to southern Russia when he was 12 years old. There, the Pontian Greeks continued with their blessed and unique traditions, without distractions, amidst a familiar Orthodox environment. I note a few things the elder told us because I consider it a pity for them to be forgotten. On the contrary, I believe they are beneficial and an example for us. The following was a very good Pontian habit. When the male children married, they remained living at the ancestral home until the grandfather's death. One could say without hesitation that Pontian households were examples of small or large Cenobitic Sino communities in which the grandfather had the position like that of an elder and to whom special respect was paid. All the family members, before leaving for the day, had to kiss the grandfather's hand and to get his blessing. At night, when the men returned from their work, the last bride had to wash all their feet. And it was not as though they were only a few men. The elder told us they used 52 spoons in his household alone. Without exaggeration, even the most organized monastic center today would be jealous of the obedience, respect, but also the religious piety of these households. There is no question that the Pontians would compete with today's Cenobitic communities when it came to fasting. They kept with precision all the fasts without oil during the year. The elder told us that the three-day abstention from all food during clean week extended from Monday until Saturday. On Wednesday and Friday, having partaken of Holy Communion during the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, they gained some strength by eating the andiderone and a little bread. Then they continued fasting from all food until Saturday when they ate the traditional meal with oil. Elder Arsenios also told us that when it came to the cultivation of virtues, his grandfather's resolve was firm. He was a model for everyone. He never lost his temper. He counseled with love and never gave the impression that he didn't practice what he taught. Indeed, sometimes grandmother put him to test to reveal his virtue to the children. Grandfather often came home exhausted from work and sat at the table for dinner. Grandmother, however, had purposefully cooked the meal with a lot of salt. When grandfather had a mouthful, he spat it out. Then, without complaining, without even making a comment, he called out, Susu ketersu, bring water. He then poured plenty of water from a jug until the food was edible and continued as if nothing happened. Other times the food was cooked with no salt at all. And again, bring salt. Having filled with these tasteless meals, he would get up, cross himself, and say from the depths of his heart, Glory to you, O God, we have eaten again today. I think these are enough to be examples for us from the strict lives of our ancestors. Little Anastasios lived his early years in this blessed environment. Like his younger sister, Parthenia, they were set apart from the others by virtue of their piety. Anastasios hardly knew Greek. However, he spoke Pontian and Turkish very well. Later, he also learned Russian. He read in the languages he knew, religious books and especially the lives of saints. St. Alexios, the man of God, held first place in his heart. The elder was filled with emotion whenever he spoke to us about the saint's life. St. Alexios was his special guardian who helped the elder during many difficult moments in his life. The elder once related to a spiritual child that he saw in a vision St. Alexios in the form of a friend of his called Alexis. His friend, having guided the elder to a very beautiful road where they were to part, disappeared. The elder searched here and there, 
and then saw Alexis in front of him. Where did you go, my friend? I was searching for you. Oh, I was going to take you to my home. I went shopping so I could treat you. They arrived shortly at a very beautiful palace that looked like a church and was full of paintings. Then the elder asked, Well, this is a beautiful palace. Whose is it? This is mine. Alexis, my friend, believe me, I am jealous. No, don't be jealous. Be patient for the moment. And later you will also come to a similar palace. Divine Desire and the Courageous Decision The desire of the two siblings for monasticism was born very early and grew strong with time. Finally, the blessed decision was made. Hearing about Palestine's sacred sites, young Anastasios' heart was kindled. He decided to leave Russia with the intention of being dedicated and serving as a monk where God himself walked. But he had to overcome one last hurdle. There was a devout punch in tradition that if someone did not christen a young child, then Christ would put a stone in their embrace in the other life. Anastasios, with the natural simplicity that characterized him, believed it. Therefore, when he learned that the wife of his brother, Leonidas, was pregnant, he was the first to ask to christen the child. The child was named Harlambos at the christening. But let us leave little Harlambos to grow up and we will occupy ourselves with him a little later. As for Anastasios, he said himself, Now, nothing was holding me back. I managed to get some money for my fare, and with a change of undergarments, I set off one nice day for the Holy Land. On foot to Constantinople Anastasios left Russia aflame with divine zeal. After walking for many days and exhausted by the many hardships on the way, he reached his first stop. As he related, My first stop was Constantinople, where I searched for a boat to take me to Palestine. But something unexpected happened. A swindler approached me and made out that he was going to show me around. The result was that he took the money that I had had for the fare. But that wasn't all. I was not in the least bit suspicious and confided in him my intention of becoming a monk. Having taken all my money with the pretext of giving me a ticket, he took me to a brothel where I was to stay the night. There he told those nice ladies to take special care of me. Since I was exhausted from my trip, I asked that they put me somewhere to sleep. A lady showed me a corner in a corridor. I immediately lay down and slept. But noises, songs, inappropriate conversations, and the like often woke me. At some point it was daybreak. I got up, thanked them, and left. As I came out, an unknown stranger stopped me and asked, What are you doing here? I answered, They brought me here to sleep. My child, they brought you to a house of ill repute, but your angel protected you. Go, now, but next time be careful. We asked the elder who, was, who that unknown stranger could have been. He responded with his usual simplicity, are you trying to figure it out? It could have been my guardian angel. It could have been St. Alexios. The swindler did not reappear, so the penniless elder managed with God's help to find a fare for Palestine. At the Holy Land Finally, Anastasios, like a thirsty deer, reached the Holy Land. He said that each step he took was accompanied by the thought that he was unworthy to walk where Christ and his All-Holy Mother walked. He arrived at the Holy Land around 1910 and stayed there about eight years, serving at various holy sites, at the Holy Sepulchre, at the Monastery of the Forerunner, and at Bethlehem. He always went with great eagerness wherever he was sent. Finally, he was tonsured a Rasafor monk at the, whole, at the Mount of Temptation and given the name Anatolios. His like-minded sister, Parthenia, was also tonsured a Rasafor nun at the age of 16 at the Holy Monastery of the Protection of God at Pontos and renamed Ephraxia. Aflame with divine zeal, she also reached the sacred holy sites of Palestine and met up with her brother, Anastasios, who arranged for her to stay at the female Cenobitic monasteries. And a few words about little Parthena. Parthena, the little sister of Anastasios, was not lacking in zeal or virtue. 
From many amazing incidents, I will mention only one from her first steps in monasticism. As her parents were from Pontos, they mainly spoke Turkish and knew a little Pontian. When they migrated to Russia, Parthena could only speak Turkish well. As we said, it wasn't long before she followed the example of her brother, so she went to the holy monastery of the protection of God at Pontos. There, however, she couldn't speak Greek, nor even understand anything from the church services. This made her very upset. One night, she saw someone in her dream who asked, Why, my child, are you so upset? You see, Elder, I don't know how to speak, nor to read, nor to write, nor to chant. Don't worry, my child. I will give you medicine for it. He opened her mouth and put inside something like a lolly. She ate it and woke up. Well, from that moment, her mind was enlightened. She learned to speak and to read and to chant and to understand, indeed very clearly, the meanings in the liturgical books. My ever-memorable elder Harlambos knew this before he became a monk and often related it to us. Meeting with Euronymous of Egina At that time, a pious hero deacon named Basil from the area near Cappadocia had visited all the sacred holy sites, ended up at the monastery of the Forerunner near the Jordan River. He served there for many months as a steward. This monk was later to become the renowned ascetic Euronymous of Egina. At the monastery of the Forerunner, the pious deacon Basil met another youth aflame with the love of God, the novice Anastasios. The meeting for both was a turning point. Anastasios finally found that which he was searching for, an appropriate guide to teach him how to struggle spiritually. Father Basil, admiring the young novice's thirst, told him all that he saw and heard, but also experienced by living with holy people in his homeland. From that day, Anastasios put in place a strict ascetic program. When he discovered the treasure of prayer and savored the first fruits, he immediately called his sister, which he introduced to the teacher. From the very first lessons, the two similar siblings were quick to feel the flame of prayer and of divine eros. As has been mentioned earlier, Anastasios was tonsured a monk or rasophore on the Mount of Temptation with the name Anatolios. He served there for eight years at different holy sites with great eagerness. However, upon hearing from his teacher that there is a place in Greece, the holy mountain, which is completely dedicated to prayer and the worship of God, he decided to migrate there without delay. His pious teacher, hero deacon Basil, after fulfilling his burning desire to visit the Holy Land, returned to Constantinople, where he stayed for a long period of time. There he was ordained a priest and became a spiritual father. Finally, by divine call, he ended up on the island of Egina. He developed a strong spiritual bond with the spiritually gifted Eronimos, the famous abbot of the holy monastery of Simonos Petra. Later, as is well known, the abbot lived in the Athens dependency of the Ascension. Father Basil received the angelic schema from this abbot and was similarly named Eronimos. Nun Aphraxia, who heard that her teacher was on the island of Egina, left the sacred holy sites where she served for many years and followed him. She found Eronimos not only to be a true spiritual father, but also a doctor and a teacher. So she arrived on the island of St. Nectarios to be with her teacher, like the first martyr, Thecla, followed Paul. Due to divine economy, I was blessed to meet this bright and spiritually gifted priest at his hermitage in Agina. Therefore, I will mention a little from what I experienced and heard from this holy man. I met holy people in my homeland from whom I attained my first foundations, he said. One of those was a married man who had children. He had built a small hut opposite his house where he struggled spiritually. He locked himself inside with neither bread nor water and gave strict orders that no one was to visit him if the door was closed. Often, he remained inside for up to 15 days without eating anything. Imagine what spiritual heights he reached, even though he was a layman. Eronimos also said for our benefit, I have never put my hands out in front of a heater to warm myself, and I have never touched a woman in my whole life. 
He stressed this frequently, of course, to protect his spiritual children from some innocent loves that the evil one often used to create existent and non-existent scandals. This elder also placed a lot of importance on the power of the Holy Cross. He always recommended that no matter what a cross be worn, you should all wear a cross around your neck. It is a frightful weapon against the devil. Not an amulet, do you hear? A cross. It doesn't matter if it's wooden or metallic. As for eye stones, he always considered them to be the evil ones. Don't go near eye stones. They are the devils. He also frequently emphasized the power of the sign of the Holy Cross when it is done correctly. With three fingers, he would say, firstly on the forehead, then on the stomach, then on the right shoulder, and then on the left. Whoever imprints himself correctly with this weapon has nothing to fear from Satan. You gave us your cross as a weapon against the devil. Elder Hieronymus was the first spiritual man I met in my life who was endowed with the rare gift of foresight and who foretold many events that would happen to my lowly self. In his teachings, Elder Hieronymus always stressed prayer and frequent Holy Communion. He said characteristically, even if you shed two drops of tears in prayer, it has a lot of strength. As for food, although he was lenient with us, he was very strict with himself. His student, the ever-memorable Mother Ephraxia, told us that his usual meal was a frugal Middle Eastern soup. I end this chapter by quoting an extract from the book Elder Eronimos of Egina by the pious author Sotiria Nusi from chapter 3. Quote, in the holy monastery of the forerunner, in the holy land, Elder Eronimos met and became closely acquainted with the novice Anastasios, the brother of Nana Fraxia. He, Elder Eronimos, also met her there for the first time, and later, with a lot of simplicity and respect, she was counted worthy to serve him for 47 years. Guided by such a teacher in Palestine, the young novice Anastasios began his great ascetic struggles. A little light on the enigma surrounding the Hermitus Photini. The ever-memorable Joachim Spetseris wrote that it was obvious Hermitus Photini would move to an unknown place when the English troops arrived near the Jordan River. The time coincided with Elder Arsenios' stay in the Holy Land when, according to divine economy, he served at the Holy Sepulchre from 1910 to 1918. Indeed, Elder Arsenios confided personally to my lowly self the following, quote, During that period, a strange beardless monk often appeared in the evening vigil at the Holy Sepulchre. He followed the service with such great concentration and piety that he became the object of curiosity among the pious pilgrims. They watched this monk with a lot of awe. It was as if he lived in a heavenly realm. He was absorbed in God, glorifying him ceaselessly, completely closed within himself. However, in a strange sort of way, when he walked past me, he glanced directly at me. What can I say? What was that look? Peaceful, meek, humble, full of sweetness and love. Love, but not how those who live in the world imagine it to be but where your mind detaches itself from this world. I said, perhaps it is you, my Christ, and you are testing me. Perhaps it's a heavenly angel, perhaps a saint. And then again, why only casting that compassionate look at me? What does it mean? One day, as I was thinking these thoughts, I heard a voice inside me while praying. He whom you see is not a man, but a woman, and she is called Fotini. This somehow satisfied my query, but there was further curiosity. Who was this Fotini? My query was resolved later, when the book The Hermitus Fotini was published. But then it was too late. I was on the holy mountain, and she was probably in heaven. Comment. In this case, the author also asks, What did that mysterious heavenly glance mean, which was cast monopolistically on then the monk Anatolios? Perhaps, as a prophet, she was quietly saying, you, who will one day go to Mount Athos, will meet someone called Joachim with a disciple called Theophylactos. Joachim will solve your query about who I am. 
in, but in return you will take over the shepherding of his orphaned spiritual child, that is, Father Theophylactos. Or perhaps she was saying, as like to like, Brother, I pleased God in the desert of the Jordan. Go therefore to the garden of the Theotokos, and also please God with intense struggles, surpassing the laws of nature. Part B. The First Years on the Holy Mountain. Obedience to the Simple Elder Ephraim. The Holy Mountain. Holy Monastery of Stavronakita. Monk Anatolios left the holy sites around 1918 and soared like an eagle to the holy mountain. He chose to stay at the poorest monastery, the holy monastery of Stavronakita, where he could struggle harder by taking advantage of the idiorhythmic program. However, it wasn't long before the virtue of this young man became known. During the day he served wherever he was needed, and then, in accordance with the program taught him by the ascetic Eronimos, he kept vigil all through the night. In a short matter of time, he was tonsured with the angelic schema and renamed Arsenios. The tonsure took place near Keries, at the large cell of the monastery of Simonos Petra, dedicated to the Annunciation of the Theotokos, as was the wish of his Anadoho. After the tonsure with the holy schema, young Arsenios' heart was ignited and ready for more ascetic feats. The holy monastery of Stavnodakita now seemed too constricted for what he yearned. The young monk was filled with mixed emotions. On the one hand was his desire for Hezekiah, and on the other, the fear that perhaps it was not God's will to leave the place of his repentance in search of a higher spiritual life. After discussing it with his elder, he was advised to make a subject of prayer, that which is mentioned in the Psalms, Make known to me, O Lord, the way wherein I should walk. God, who loves man and who does the will of those who fear him, didn't take long to inform this pure soul with similar words as those of his namesake, Arsenios the Great. Arsenios, flee and be saved. Arsenios, be silent and still. Towards the inner desert, having been informed of the higher calling, nothing could now hold him back. He immediately received the blessing from his Anadoho and ran to the summit of Athos like a thirsty deer. At that time, there were many renowned God-bearing ascetics and spiritual fathers there. One of those bright spiritual stars was Elder Daniel, who was the founder of the famous namesake, the Denolehi Brotherhood. Meeting of Monk Arsenios with the Young Francis By divine calling and economy, another young man with rare spiritual zeal had forsaken the world and arrived at the Holy Mountain around 1920 or 1921. He searched the caves and holes of the Holy Mountain, seeking God-bearing ascetics to saturate his spiritual thirst. As if by divine plan, the two young men climbed the Holy Summit on the 5th toward the 6th of August for the consecrated feast of the Transfiguration. Their first encounter was there on the summit. After confirming that they had the same quest and divine desire, they promised to remain inseparable until death. But it's also worth mentioning that Father Arsenios knew his limitations and could see in the then layman Francis great gifts and especially administrative capabilities. Therefore he asked Francis to be in charge and characteristically told Francis, from now on you are the eye and I am the ear. Coming down from the summit of the holy mountain they passed by Elder Daniel, who was mentioned previously and indeed confirmed that he was a contemporary, God-bearing father. But because of their excessive zeal, which did not allow them to sit at the common Cenobitic refectory, they did not stay there. However, before departing for their new struggles, they decided to seek advice from this experienced and famous spiritual father. The elder could see their genuine zeal and didn't want to stop them from their course. However, he stressed that it was imperative that they submit themselves in obedience to an experienced elder until his death. This was to protect them from the danger of delusion and to inherit his blessing. However, to enrich the narrative and to taste a little of their rare zeal and of the first struggles of Francis, I hand over the pen to him and to one of his many letters, which are like an autobiography from the book Monastic Wisdom, Letter 37. Quote, when I was in the world, 
I secretly had harsh struggles full of blood. I ate only once every two days, and only after 3 p.m. The mountains and caves of Penteli knew me as a pelican hungering, crying, seeking salvation. I was testing myself to see if I was able to endure the toils and become a monk on the holy mountain. So once I had practiced well enough for a few years, I begged the Lord to forgive me for eating every other day, and I promised that when I would go to the holy mountain, I would eat once every eight days, as is written in the lives of the saints. End quote. Imbued with this rare divine desire, they went to all the famous hermitages, caves, and holes of the Athenite land to saturate their spiritual thirst, as Francis characteristically writes in this letter, quote, All the caves of Athos received me as their guest, step by step. I sought to find a spiritual father to teach me heavenly theoria and praxis. The Search for an Elder The famous and great Hezekis Kalinikos lived a little further down from the Deneloe Brotherhood. Father Arsenio said, We visited him and pleaded with him to allow us to stay with his brotherhood. He allowed us to stay, but his only advice was that we had to be totally obedient. Yes, let it be blessed, Elder, whatever you want, but also tell us how to struggle. Then that great ascetic told us, if I teach you my technique, and you are sweetened with the honey of Hezekiah, then who will do all the work of the cell? Then what shall we do? Be obedient now, and when I die you will inherit my gift. The young monks looked at each other. They were harsh words. Indeed, obedience was the great Hezekist's principle. Father Arsenios continued, Actually, this response indirectly made us leave because Father Kalinikos lived as a recluse. He didn't open for anyone. However, there was a signal which his neighbors knew and that was to hold up a handkerchief like a flag. This meant that something was needed and the first person to see it went inside the hut. Then we asked Father Kalinikos again, Elder, if we leave from here, would you accept to see us occasionally to give us advice? Of course, as long as you first hand, you first find an elder, and with his blessing, I will be at your disposal. I don't think that this great Hezekist's methods should not be commented on. He lived on dry food and kept all-night vigils. However, he handed over the reins to blessed obedience and the cutting of one's will. In this way, he was in complete agreement with the advice of Elder Daniel, the shining star of the small Cenobitic Deneloi community, and with all the blessed and God-bearing fathers. They all profess that unless we have obedience, no matter how difficult our life is, we build a house on sand. In the letter previously mentioned, Elder Yosef describes his first spiritual vision when he acquired unceasing prayer. As he says it, it was, quote, one day when I had many temptations. However, he is silent about the type and magnitude of the many temptations. Father Arsenios makes them known to us. The only thing that we can confess with amazement is that indeed, as the psalm says, he went through fire and water. Elder Yosef experienced the first great divine visitation, as he writes himself, while hungry and exhausted from crying, see letter 37. This shows that, as the Lord says, it is only through trials and tribulations that we will enter the kingdom of God. The Two Strugglers in Submission to the Simple and Saintly Elder Ephraim As the 37th letter says, quote, Finally, we found a simple, good, guileless little elder who gave us his blessing to struggle as much as we could and to confess to whichever spiritual father we felt comfortable with. This little elder was the renowned Elder Ephraim the Barrel Maker, whose hut was dedicated to the Annunciation of the Theotokos and which was a little further down from the Deneloia Brotherhood. It wasn't long before this elder tonsured the novice Francis with the great schema, and as a monk gave him the name Yosef. It would be unjust if we didn't say anything about the virtues of this saintly elder Ephraim, especially his poverty, generosity, and frugality. But the crown of all his virtues was blessed simplicity, which unfortunately many took advantage of for personal gain. Elder Ephraim's main work was making barrels, 
He never refused to help anyone, no matter how busy he was, nor asked for money. He was an excellent barrel maker and accepted whatever money he was given. This resulted in the elder working day and night for others and doing injustice to his spiritual work. Even lay people heard about Elder Ephraim and went to, went to him to have a barrel made. When he finished the barrel, if it was worth 1,000 drachmas, they gave him 50 or 100 drachmas and asked, Is that okay, Elder Ephraim? Yes, yes, it, it's good, my child, thank you. Father Arsenio said, It didn't take long for us to realize what was happening, so one day Father Yosef called me and said, This work not only disrupts our stillness, but our elder is also in danger of fatigue due to his great generosity. Let us pray, Father Arsenio, and then ask if he agrees that we move from here with him to a quieter place. That's what happened. When we told the elder our thought, it was as if we provided him with a solution to his problem. He agreed with much happiness and urged us to search for a quieter place. At the Skeet of St. Basil, 1923 to 1938, Elder Arsenios continued, Having in mind that we principally had to free our elder from the heavy work, we turned our gaze toward the Skeet of St. Basil. We found a remote place there which was quiet and difficult to access. Since our elder agreed with joy to relocate, one fine morning we bade farewell to our little chapel of the Annunciation and to all our neighbors and took our elder with a few necessities on a mule to St. Basil. The sheer and steep crags rightly had to be dedicated to the first ascetic and leader of monasticism. Therefore the chapel that we built was named in honor of the great forerunner. We now began our intense struggles in this blessed place. In the meantime, our elder, free from worldly cares, gave all his strength to higher spiritual struggles and remained standing all night. As usual, Elder Arsenios, wanting to entertain us, added, Naturally, toward the end of his life, our elder's strength began to fail him, and he was no longer able to do the all-night vigils and prayer ropes that he did previously. At that time, Monk Matthew lived at St. Basil. He later led a group of old calendar followers. He had the habit of preaching to the ascetics from a pulpit during communal gatherings. One day he said in his sermons, Brothers, the days have been shortened. On returning home, our elder told us with simplicity, Good on Father Matthew. Today he solved my problem. That's why I can no longer do as many prayer ropes as before. The days have been shortened. Father Arsenios replied with the same simplicity, No, elder, you have become weaker and you are falling asleep. The elder said again, No, Matthew has said it. The nights have been shortened. With this rare gift of simplicity, the elder foresaw his end and, having forsaken the temporary things of this world, left his two disciples with his blessing forever. Monk Arsenios, in a vision, sees Elder Ephraim after his blessed repose. Before I refer to the pertinent vision, it is opportune to also refer to the following. We have already said that the ever-memorable Elder Ephraim was an excellent barrel maker. However, I forgot to mention that he was also an excellent wood carver. Apart from barrel making, he was also involved with wood carving and had carved the iconostasis for many holy churches. When monks Yosif and Arsenis lived with Elder Ephraim at Katonakia, the church of the cell of the archangels was being renovated. A wood carver quoted the cell's elder, 20 gold pounds, to make the iconostasis. Because the cell's elder couldn't afford to pay that much, he asked Elder Ephraim, Can you make the iconostasis? I can. There was no discussion about price. Elder Ephraim worked hard and finished the iconostasis. Now for the payment. The cell's elder searched the treasury and found two pounds. He took them, gave them to Elder Ephraim, and said, Is that okay, Elder Ephraim? Fine, fine, Elder, thank you. Elder Arsenio said, As soon as I found out, it was like I was set on fire. I couldn't hold back. I went to Elder Ephraim and told him, Yeronda, I draw the line. I can't handle this. The others asked for 20 pounds, and you have been paid off with two pounds? The simple but wise elder friend responded, 
If we get paid for everything here, my child, what will remain in heaven? Then I realized that our elder was not silly. We couldn't reach the virtue that he had, but to see it with my own eyes, I will tell you what God showed me. While I was praying, I saw in a vision our elder Ephraim a few days after his repose. He was in a most delightful place. His face shone from a lot of glory, and he stood in a beautiful little church. I was glad to see him in so much glory and asked him, Elder, what is that beautiful little church? Ah, that is mine. Remember when I carved that iconostasis with two pounds? Because I didn't get paid and because I didn't grumble nor criticize, Christ kept it for me in heaven. Remember what I told you? Elder Arsenios continued, I recovered from the vision filled with joy. Even after death, my elder taught me a great lesson, which I remember for my whole life. Elder Arsenios related this incident to many people. My ever-memorable elder Harlambos related this often, so it would be an example for us. Part C. More intense struggles after the blessed repose of their elder. Monk Yosif takes the initiative. Immediately after the repose of their elder, Monk Arsenios said to Father Yosif, Brother, you know that I can't take on initiatives, so please take over the responsibilities, and I promise that I will be obedient to you until death. This demonstrates Father Arsenios' humility, which was one of his attributes from a very early age. Real worth is not in knowing everything, but in discerning your own abilities and recognizing the gifts of others. Although Father Arsenios was ten years older and was tonsured a monk for longer, he was able to squash the demon of vainglory, preferring exemplary obedience to one who was younger. This was despite the fact that according to the rules of the Holy Mountain, one who is older in the Brotherhood automatically succeeds his elder. Indeed, Father Arsenios was not wrong in his calculations. As was shown later, Father Yosif was a man with many and great gifts, which he used wisely, not only for himself, but also for his fellow ascetic and for all those who followed him. Although Father Yosif called all who later joined the brotherhood children or disciples, he always referred to Father Arsenios as his brother and fellow ascetic. Even in the communal meetings, he rightly gave him honors as that of an elder. Bitter struggles now begin for these two great strugglers. With Daniel the Hezekist and Father Kiro. Father Arsenio said, In our search for blessed and God-bearing fathers, we discovered in St. Peter's cave a rare ascetic, Father Daniel. He was endowed with the gift of tears, which was the source of many other gifts that adorned him, especially the gifts of discernment, insight, and foresight. As an example of his gift of foresight, I will mention what happened to my spiritual child, Father Kirill, from Nuskeet. There is a hut in Nuskeet, which is dedicated to the life-giving spring. A young man lived there who left behind an orphaned brother. As he was worried about his brother, he decided to go and visit Father Daniel, although he didn't know the elder, and seek the elder's advice. Before Father Kirill managed to say anything, Father Daniel called him by name and said, Father Kiro, don't worry about Nikos. He is well and is preparing to shortly come here with you. In fact, after a little while, Nikos came and stayed with his brother. However, since we mentioned Father Kiro, I will say a few words about him because it's worthwhile and then we will continue with Father Daniel. Nikos stayed with his brother, became a monk, and later a priest, and was known to all as Father Neophytos. When their elder died, the two monks were only Rosophores. They joined us when we went down to Nuskeet with our elder and our brotherhood from the caves of Little St. Anne. After the repose of our elder, they told me their thoughts. I finally decided to make Father Kirill a great schema monk. He, in turn, as the elder now of their cell, became the Anadaho of Father Neophytos. Although outwardly they didn't seem to differ from the other fathers, However, they both became secret workers of virtue, especially Kirill, who toward the end of his life, that is 1966-67, acquired the great gifts of insight and foresight. 
To some people he revealed unconfessed sins, and to many others he answered queries and unsolved problems. I will refer to a couple of specific incidents. He said to an elder of a brotherhood, All your monks are doing very well except for H. The elder said, Father Kirill, you are wrong. I don't have anyone called H in my brotherhood. Father Kirill replied, You do. The elder left a little dissatisfied. However, it was not long before one of the brothers in the community was deceived by the evil one. Despite appearing to be doing well, he kept his thoughts secret to such an extent that he left for the world. The evil one made him get rid of his monastic cassock and scream in the streets, I am called H. That was his name before he became a monk. But the most amazing thing is that he predicted the future of our then small brotherhood, saying, Many abbots will come from these huts, pointing to ours. Indeed, although it seems unbelievable, nothing more and nothing less than five abbots came from these small huts. Elder Arsenios continued about the great Hezekist Elder Daniel. Elder Daniel had a program of keeping vigil and celebrating the liturgy every night exact, exactly at midnight. He wouldn't allow anyone to be with him except for his disciple, Father Antonios, who de deliturgized. This event was misconstrued, and many thought that Father Daniel was deluded. However, this was because each time Father Daniel celebrated the liturgy, he shed so many tears that the liturgy was extended by two or three hours. As soon as it finished, he immediately closed himself in his cell, continuing to shed tears for hours on end. Thankfully, and as an exception, he allowed Elder Yosef and me to stay at the liturgy. When it ended, because he knew that we were waiting for him to say a few holy words, the first comments he said were, St. Sinclitiki says, A lamp gives light, but it burns its own lips. He meant what he said because he was afraid of losing the state he was in by talking. Nevertheless, he would say a few words to us and... To not waste time, he read our thoughts, understood what our problems were, and then gave us appropriate advice before sending us off in peace. His meals were always the same. All year round, he ate only once a day boiled beans. The principal monastery sent a sack full of beans once a year. The blessed elder, who left everything in God's hands, ate the beans and said without complaining, This is what God has sent us. This is what we shall eat. Elder Yosef though could not tolerate this because a hesychist who eats only beans will get bloating and other side effects. That's why, without asking Elder Daniel, he went to the monastery of the Great Lavra to sort it out. From then on, the Lavra never sent beans again. From this great ascetic and from Father Kalinikos, we received the rule of all-night vigils in our daily diet. All year round, we ate only once a day. Five days a week, we ate without oil, but on the weekends, we poured a few drops of oil on our frugal food, but again, we ate only once a day. Our most common meal was rusks. We rarely had any fresh bread. Indeed, Father Daniel also set a limit. He took a handful and told us, there, that's how much you should eat. If we happened to find any wild greens or something else lying around, we ate it with the rusks. On weekends, we also ate a sardine or some cheese if we found any. The great elder witnesses to this in his 37th letter, saying, quote, Our rule was to eat a little bread and food once a day in moderation, and even if it was Pascha or the day before Lent, we had food only once a day. Furthermore, the entire year we kept vigil all night long. Elder Arsenios and I received this rule from a holy elder who practiced watchfulness, Father Daniel. We now close this chapter about this great ascetic, Father Daniel, and hope that whoever knows more about his amazing life, beyond the little that we learn from Elder Arsenios, will bring it forward for publication. Rusk, the common diet of ascetics. We once asked Elder Arsenios where they found the rusks, which, as we saw, was their basic means of nourishment. He told us, In our time, the monasteries gathered what was left over from the refectory, they made it into rusks and sh shared it among the ascetics. Whether it was good or bad, we took it. Sometimes it even had worms. 
Once I went to a monastery to get some rusks. The assigned monk gave me a sackful. It's a lot, I told him. No, take it. I had to climb the summit of St. Basil carrying a full sack from the monastery and a bag with various other things. Finally, I arrived. We opened it with our elder, and what did we see? It was full of worms. Humanly, I grumbled. Why didn't that blessed person throw it to the mules? Was it necessary that I go to so much effort for nothing? Then the elder told me, Why for nothing, Father Arsenios? What shall we do with it? What shall we do with it? We shall eat it. This is what God has given us. If we were worthy of anything better, we would have been given something better. But, Elder, what shall we do with the worms? The Elder thought about it a little and said, I have found the answer. From now on we will eat when it gets dark, and that way we won't see the worms. Elder Arsenius concluded, And that's what happened, until we ate it all. We asked, Yerono didn't anything un untoward happened to your health? In the beginning, Father Arsenio says, I don't lie. I found it difficult, but what could you do, since that's what the elder said to do? Then, believe me, God made it so tasty it was like we were eating the best sweet. That was also a fruit of Elder Arsenio's utter obedience. Footnote, the actual eating of worms is minimal as the dry rusk is soaked in water and any worms come out. To continue, another time Elder Yosif wanted to test me, said Father Arsenios. It had just gone dark when he said, Come, Father Arsenios, let's eat rusks. Say the words, meaning to say grace, our Father. I finished and prepared to eat the rusks, but I heard the Elder tell me, Father Arseni, let's assume that we've eaten. Say thanksgiving. Even though I was hungry, I stood up and out of obedience, said thanksgiving. Yes, but the same thing was repeated for three or four days. On the fourth day, my strength failed me because we worked hard during the day and even harder at night with the vigil. Then I said to the elder, Bless, elder, but I can't cope any longer. What shall I do? Well, then, let's eat tonight, he replied. The strong elder Yosif induced this kind little elder through obedience and similar and even harder struggles and it just wasn't for a day or two, but for thirty whole years. Elder Arsenios always had a photo of his elder and fellow ascetic by his pillow when we met him. If anyone asked, Who is that, Yerona? The standard response with all his simplicity was, I walked barefoot together with the one you see for forty years. Indeed, whether it was summer or winter, even in the snow, they always walked barefoot. The Tradition About the Naked Ascetics and the Two Barefoot Monks El Darsenio said, One night we walked barefoot in the snow from St. Anne to our hut. When the other fathers of the skeet saw the footsteps, they rang the bells of the church. The monks of the skeet ran to the church to find out what was happening, why the bells were ringing, because it, it wasn't a feast day. A monk then told them, Finally, we have found the naked ascetics. A footnote. The naked ascetics, during the long history of the holy mountain, the following tradition exists. A group of seven ascetics, according to others, twelve, have as their sole work unceasing prayer for the whole world. They have been given special grace from the Lord to live without a home and to be naked and invisible from the sight of men. To continue, here are their tracks. Let's follow their footsteps and see where they live. They climbed up to our cave and asked commandingly, where have you hidden the naked ascetics? Father Arsenius replied in his usual sweet simplicity, What naked ascetics? Look, they came here. You can see their footprints. Fathers, we were the ones walking. There aren't any naked ascetics here. It's not you. There are naked ascetics. Naturally, it was unbelievable. It is common knowledge that one will get frostbite if he walks barefoot in the frozen snow. However, the two ascetics, one with his faith in God and the other through obedience to his elder, live extraordinary states that transcended normal human experience. Another time, 
while loaded with things as they climbed up to their hut along the frozen footpath, the two ascetics began to get weary. Then Elder Yosef said, The machine has weakened, Father Arsenios. Let's pause for a little to regain our strength. The two ascetics parted the snow to the right and the left and began kneeling repeatedly and saving, saying fervent prayers. Having united their burning tears with the icy water, they felt renewed and then comfortably climbed the ascending track to the hut. Elder Arsenios told us, Another time, by doing my own will, I paid for it. We had to go somewhere, but Elder Yosef did not feel well. I encouraged him, and we set off, barefoot in the snow, but we got stranded halfway. My elder told me, Arsenios, the machine has stopped. What are we going to do? I didn't know whether he was serious or joking, but I grabbed him and slung him over my shoulders and carried him until we got to the hut. From then on, I learned never to do my own will. When we went somewhere, we had a rule that one was to walk 15 to 20 meters ahead of the other to avoid idle talk and to say the prayer unceasingly. If someone happened to pass us by, we greeted him with a reverence without speaking. But sometimes there were people who were curious. They saw two barefooted and ragged monks. Where are you from? Where are you going? Aren't you cold walking barefoot? The elder was silent. However, I was open-hearted, and I couldn't help it. I'd exchange a few words. Afterwards, the elder confronted me and asked ironically, What happened, Father Arsenios? Did you confess the person? Is he clean? Is he worthy to be a priest? The elder corrected me with these side remarks. But, elder, couldn't the other fathers understand your struggles? Our elder tried to hide as much as he could, and we also played the fools a little. That's why many monks thought that we were deluded. Once we went to a feast. After the liturgy, everyone was going into the refectory. We followed. When the monk in charge of the refectory saw us barefoot and with tattered clothing, he started shouting at us and threw us out. We left without saying a word. Then an unknown person came behind us. He put us in a room and brought us all kinds of food to eat. Obedience is better than sacrifice. As I wrote in the beginning, these two ascetics were like one body. It was as if they had agreed to complement each other. Indeed, Elder Arsenios greatly surpassed the great elder in his physical struggles. After many hours of vigil during the night, the great elder busied himself with handiwork, making simple little crosses. Meanwhile, Elder Arsenios tended to all the outside jobs of the house and on the terraced gardens. Often he went down to the arsanas, the small port storehouses to keep produce for the monasteries and skis, to load goods weighing about 60 to 70 kilograms, not only for themselves, but mainly to help out the other elderly ascetics. This was part of Elder Arsenios's duties. For years, Elder Arsenios never sat down during vigils, nor would he do anything less than 3,000 prostrations. As Elder Yosef wrote in his letters, neither of them slept in a lying position for years. Elder Arsenio said, But in the end, the nuns corrected this excessive behavior. Elder Yosef sometimes went out of Athos to support the monasteries. In one of the female monasteries, the nuns noticed that they found the bed as they made it. This reached the ears of the abbess. She called the elder and told him, Do you know how to be obedient? I do. Well then, as of today, you will lie on the bed when you rest. Father Arsenios continued, The elder truly found himself in a difficult position when he was obedient. For the first time he slept lying down, and when he awoke, he felt so rested, so clear-minded, that he understood the words of Scripture, Obedience is better than sacrifice. First Kings 15.22 Septuagint to continue. The vigil went so well that he, when he returned, he told me, Father Arsenios, from today we will rest on our wooden beds. Without entering into any discussion, I said, let it be blessed. A kind intention and the elder's blessing. Many came to us, but only a few were able to stay because it was a difficult life. 
They did, however, learn some lessons from the elder and went to stay wherever they could. Elder Yosif told them, It's best and safe to go where you can be obedient and to have a humble mind. Elder Arsenios, after such a tiring vigil, how were you able to climb such a steep ascent carrying a load? I naturally have a strong constitution, but when a disciple has faith in the blessing of the elder, he can lift a mountain. Often, I carried more than I had the strength to carry, and I almost buckled. However, when I crossed myself and asked for the elder's blessing, the load became lighter on its own. It was as if someone was pushing me, and I soared like a bird, saying the prayer constantly. Indeed, one day when the elder had to go out into the world, he told me, Father Arsenios, I will return in about 15 days with lots of things. Come down when you hear the small sailboat blow its horn. I replied, Let it be blessed. When the elder left, I thought, Arsenios, now that you are on your own, why don't you be stricter with yourself? Apart from the all-night vigil, I didn't eat anything for a week, thinking that the elder was still a long way off. But right on time, I heard the horn of the boat. The elder had arrived. I ran down immediately and loaded around 70 kilos on my back. I got a blessing from the elder and flew back up. Elder, where did you get water from up there? We had a water tank and gathered rainwater from the gutters, just enough for our basic needs. However, if we had to repair our cells, I had to travel far to get water. One day the elder felt sorry for me because of the burning hot sun. He said to Panagia, O oh, Panagia, I beg you, arrange for some water because Father Arsenios is laboring very hard. He immediately heard a noise from the nearby rock. He turned to look, and what did he see? The rock was sweating drops of water. We immediately put a bowl underneath to gather it. It was sufficient. From then on, I was relieved from traveling far to find water. Amazing events from the life of the two ascetics. Elder, you said that Elder Yosef would go out into the world. Didn't you go out with him? Elder Yosef had the great gift of being able to support souls, whereas with me, I was out of place, like a fox going out to market. However, we went out once together as a favor for my sister. We went to Agina with the elder to see my sister and to meet her spiritual father, Father Eronimos. When the two elders spoke privately, as my sister, Mother Ephraxia, later told me, Eronimos was amazed by the things he heard from the holy mouth of Elder Yosef. From then on, Eronimos held Elder Joseph in high regard. Once, when my elder needed me outside of the holy mountain, we also went to my relatives in Drama in northern Greece, where they had migrated after Russia due to the communist oppression. Another time, when I was on my own again at St. Basil, I don't know how, but a man from Piraeus lost his way and ended up outside my hut. I extended hospitality to him for a short time and offered that he stay the night. No, no, I'm leaving. Father, how can you live for years here among the rocks? Even if you tied me up, I would cut the rope and leave. Where do you live? In Piraeus. If you were to tie me up in Piraeus, I would cut the rope and come here. The elder, with his simplicity, truly gave a wise and appropriate answer, and continued, Oh, this is nothing. Another man made us go down to St. Anne's from St. Basil's in the middle of the night because he was scared and couldn't cope. He came in the evening. The elder let the visitor sleep in his own cell and went to church for the vigil. At one point we heard shouting and screaming. We ran to see the visitor. He fell on us bracing himself and shaking all over. What's wrong, blessed one? He fell at our feet in tears. The demons came and beat me. They're going to kill me. Take me quickly to St. Anne's. I can't cope here. The elder told him, Rest, my child, until morning. They won't hit you again. They made a mistake. Every night they assail and beat me, but tonight you got hit mistakenly. No matter what we told him, he wouldn't hear a word of it. I want to leave. What could we do? 
It was night and dark, but we took him down to St. Anne's. But, Elder, would you really get beaten by the demons? We were both beaten a lot in the first years, particularly Elder Yosef, because his prayer burnt the demons. They hit me less because I didn't have a high spiritual state, but primarily because I was a disciple. When a disciple is obedient and confesses his thoughts, then he cuts their authority. When the evil one sees that you give yourself to obedience and you perform your spiritual duties, he will try to get you to you by making you hide your thoughts from the elder, said Father Arsenios. He continued, I'll tell you an incident that occurred where the evil one would have snatched one of our monks if our elder didn't have special gifts. There at St. Basil's, Father John of Locke came and stayed with us. He was a very pious but simple person, but for a certain period of time, he stopped saying his thoughts to the elder. The elder called him. How are you going, Father John? Well, very well, elder. Don't you have any thoughts to confess? No, no, I'm very well. In the meantime, the elder in his prayers felt very uneasy for Father John. Something was telling him that Father John wasn't well. The elder then told me, Quickly, get Father John. I called him. He came and the elder told him very severely, I want you to confess your thoughts. But elder, I don't have anything. The elder wouldn't give in. You are not going to leave unless you confess. Then Father John was forced to speak and he began mumbling. Bless elder, but I have an order from my angel not to say anything to anyone. See, with your blessing, I was recently counted worthy to pray together with my angel. However, since you forced me, it's an opportunity to ask for forgiveness if I have been at fault in anything. As we have agreed with my angel, tomorrow night we are going to Father Matthew so that I can take Holy Communion, and then Prophet Elias is going to take my soul with a flaming chariot. When the elder heard him, he slapped him. There go the chariots, and there go the rides, the elder told him. Hey, deluded one, the devil has taken you by the hand to throw you off a cliff into hell, and you don't say anything? But Yerunda, is that possible? Wait, you will see if that is possible. That same night, at the time of the angel's visit, Father John saw not a disguised angel, but the devil in his real form, with horns, telling him angrily, didn't I tell you, you bad old monk, not to say our secret to the elder? You got off lightly. I had a good plan to drop you off a cliff. When Father John heard that, he shuddered in horror and immediately ran to the elder. He fell on his knees and thanked the elder. See how many dangers exist if a monk hides his thoughts. Advice and amazing events from the life of Elder Arsenios. Someone else from another brotherhood came to monasticism with a lot of fervor. He became a disciple of a tough elder, struggled a lot in the beginning. He remained standing the whole night during vigils, did prostrations, fasts, obedience, frank confession, and so on. But after two or three years, he eased off, gave authority to the devil, and started going spiritually backwards. His mind was muddied, muddled while praying. He would sit, then fall asleep. When he woke in the morning, he felt tired and would fall back to sleep again. Anyway, he struggled to fulfill his spiritual duties. As if that wasn't enough, he was also assailed fiercely by the demon of fornication. At the same time, this brought on despair that in his state he would certainly be condemned. However, the most frightful thing was that he felt embarrassed and would not confess. The devil told him, You wretch, you were able to do so many vigils with so many prostrations, so many tears, so much struggle. Now, what will you say to your elder? If he hears about the state you're in, and especially your battle with fornication, you will surely be expelled. Why don't you leave on your own accord? He thought, But I still have to find some excuse to leave. What will I do? It seemed that God had pity on him and gave him the thought, Why don't you go to Father Arsenios and tell him your thoughts? 
The monk came to me with his head bowed in shame and managed to say everything with a lot of effort, including his battle with fornication. He thought through his inexperience that I would be affronting when he confessed. However, I knew from experience the wiles of the devil, and so I hugged him and said, Well done, my child. I knew you to be a struggler and that Christ loves you. Me, elder? Yes, you. To prove it, I want to tell. I want you to tell me sincerely, when you were struggling hard and had no assaults, how did you think about yourself? Yeah, I don't know. I was a small saint then, but now I am the worst of all. Well done. May you be blessed. Now you are speaking correctly. All our struggles and efforts have to make us humble in the end. You were never a saint, but the grace of God protected you, and you thought. That state was your own. That's why grace left you, to make you realize who you are. However, grace will return with confession. In the future, never be embarrassed to confess everything to your elder, and always firmly keep the thought that I am nothing. Whatever good I have, it is from God, through the prayers of my elder. If grace deserts me, I will immediately fall again. From then on, the monk confessed to his elder, and to this day struggles with a lot of eagerness. From these examples, we can conclude that the seal of Elder Arsenios' harsh struggles was that he reached the state of humility. He learned from the Holy Spirit the same words that Christ told Siloan, the contemporary Russian ascetic, keep your mind in hell and don't despair. A few comments about St. Siloan the Athenite. Since we have brought to mind that great contemporary Russian ascetic, I once asked Elder Arsenios, Elder, did you ever meet St. Siloan? We heard a lot about that great ascetic. Elder Joseph asked me if I wanted to meet him, but I said no. But why? I knew Russian. The elder didn't. I did not feel at ease to be the one speaking and for my elder to be listening only. However, we knew Father Sofroni well. He found us on his own and frequently came because he held great respect for Elder Yosef. A fo important footnote, Father Sofroni, in his book St. Siloan, writes that in his days on the Holy Mountain, he met seven great ascetics. Here a monk, Zacharias from Essex, confirms that one of those was Elder Yosef. To continue, in this case, the refusal to the elder's proposal is not considered disobedience, but is an example of great humility and discernment. As a disciple, Father Arsenios was not at ease to be speaking and for the elder to be listening. Many of us should take note of this example. Keeping Vigils A brother who heard the previously mentioned account about the young struggler told Elder Arsenios, Elder, in the beginning, I also stood all night in vigils and did double the amount of prayer ropes. The state of contrition and tears was never absent. I was completely free of warfare. I was obedient and I worked with eagerness. However, I can't force myself now in the same way, and I can't even stand all night in prayer. The bad thing is that when I sit, I become negligent and want to sleep. How many hours do you sleep? Four to five. My child, don't look at what we used to do. We older people had a different constitution. This wretched body expects its dues. You work hard all day and your sleep is not enough. From now on, you will sleep for six to six and a half hours. You will sleep around four to four and a half hours in the afternoon and two in the morning. The monk with youthful enthusiasm. But elder, shouldn't we struggle a little? The elder said, jesting, Well then, don't sleep as long so you can sleep while you are praying. This monk assured me that with the elder's discerning advice, he found his usual order again during vigils. Another brother asked, Elder, during the night I keep vigil, but I have difficulty standing, and most of the time I sit, but sometimes negligence assails me, and I sleep. If the night watchman gets tired standing, he sits. If sleep overcomes him and he begins to nod while he is sitting, he doesn't break the law. However, 
If he is found lying down sleeping, then he loses his job. It's the same with us. If we are overcome with a bit of sleep and begin to nod while we are struggling, then it doesn't matter that much. If, however, the evil one manages to make us lie down, then we have been crushed. What should we do, Elder, if we become sleepy? Ah, there are many medicines, said Elder Arsenios. You pray standing and get tired? Then don't sit, but kneel. If you get sleepy, even while kneeling, then stand. Go for a short stroll and say the prayer aloud with as much feeling as you can from the depths of your heart. Doesn't David say, Out of the depths I have cried to you? Psalm 131. There's also another medicine. Throw some water on your face. St. Isaac the Syrian says, One who wants to be saved will find means. If all these are of little use, then there is a stronger medicine. Elder Yosef used to call it a remedy for all the passions. Get a stick, and when you get sleepy or you're assailed by thoughts, then give yourself a couple of strong blows on your thighs. We'll see. Do you wake up or do you not wake up? We have a tipicon from our elder to drink a cup of coffee before the vigil. It helps you arouse from sleep. And don't leave the prostrations until the end. If we have fervent prayer from the beginning, if we have theoria and contrition, then we shouldn't try to finish our prayer rule as quickly as possible. Later, when the machine loses power and needs fuel, we fire it up again. We do this through these various means as well as the usual prostrations and the crossing of ourselves, which our daily prayer rule imposes on each of us according to our elders' discretion. All these are medicines until the machine is relit, until we compel the compassion of Christ to warm our hearts. If he also gives us some tears, then our eyes remain wide open. Oh, those tears! Struggle as much as you can while you are young to love Christ and our Panagia, to taste those sweet tears of love. You have acquired tears, then the vigil is like a feast. Elder Arsenios even paid attention to other factors such as weather conditions. The best season for prayer is autumn and spring when the weather is fair. If prayer is not going well during these seasons, then something else is certainly not going well. The devil has authority and self-examination is needed as well as confession and the guarding of the senses. That's why be careful as much as you can of a disobedience, condemnation, pride, jealousy, overeating, and from whatever gives authority to the devil, but also from slackness. It's time to wake up, then don't turn from side to side yawning. Don't wake up like you are worn out. Monastic life requires vitality. We either live or die. You have woken up, get up, do your cross, and say immediately, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Isu Christe eleison me. The other thing that the elder emphasized for prayer to progress well was faith in the person of the elder and the clean redemption of thoughts. But also, another very important indicator of our spiritual progress is the presence of grace on Sundays and on all the big feast days. If one does not notice a doubling of grace on these days, then something is not going well. program. One of the basic elements of a monk is the program. Father Arsenios would say, just as he learned from the great elder, that a genuine monk does not have a program, but also he doesn't progress without a program. He explained that a disciple never has the right to be disobedient to his elder in order not to break the program. However, when it's not a matter of obedience, he must be very strict to the program. If it's time for the diaconima, then do not waste time for a moment. Work, but work for as long as the tipicon says. If you say, just a little longer and a little longer, then gradually you have missed vespers. Then it's time for sleep, but you do vespers. There is even worse. Some people, instead of sleeping when it's time to sleep, they sit and chatter idly. They go to sleep late, and they wake up even later. 
Then there is sleeplessness, anomalies, and no interest in the prayer rule. Father Arsenios told us, Once, at Little St. Anne, when it was time for sleep, the monks came from afar, loaded with provisions and some fish. They said, Elder, we brought fish. They must be cooked or they will go off. Elder Yosif didn't enter into any conversation. He simply replied, I prefer the fish to go off than to break my tipicon. Leave them as they are and go to sleep straight away. The next day the elder told us, I left the fish go off on purpose so that you remember this example your whole lives. It was not as if the elder was wasteful. Many times we ate sour food at St. Basil so it would not be thrown away. Actually, once at Nuski, in order not to throw away the beans that started going off, the elder prayed fervently with tears because the monks could not eat sour food. The next day, he gave us the beans and we ate them. They were so tasty, they were like a sweet. Once a plate of food was left over and we put it in the fanari. A footnote, the fanari, a food safe used on the holy mountain before they had fridges to keep food cold and cool. It is like a wooden cupboard with wire meshing which is hung up to air the food that is kept inside. There weren't any fridges back then. By the next day, it had already gone off. We sat at the table to eat, and when the cook served the food, he mentioned the food that had gone off. Elder Arsenios then said, Bring it to me to eat. But, Elder, it's not fit for eating. It's gone off, and it will upset you. I will get upset if I don't eat it. He ate it in front of all of us, and he is yet to get sick. Elder, what should one do when he isn't able to sleep during the time for rest? The Holy Fathers say, Sit in your cell, and the cell will teach you. Reading Elder Arsenios considered reading imperative and would say, Reading is a type of prayer. Every day we used to read one or two chapters from the Holy Bible and then patristic books. As for St. Isaac the Syrian, we always held his book under our arms. If you don't have any other book but only Isaac the Syrian, it is enough. It says everything. However, we also read The Ladder of Divine Ascent, Abba Dorotheus, the Evangetinos, St. Macarius, and the lives of our saints. When we read the lives of saints, we gain two things. Firstly, the example of their struggles wakes us up from the num numbness of negligence. And secondly, when we read the lives of saints with reverence, the saints intercede to Christ for us. Before beginning to read, we must always pray. When we read the life of a saint, it can affect us so deeply that we can't control the tears. This happens because prayer enlightens the mind. Elder, what should we concentrate on when reading the Holy Bible? All of the Holy Bible is God-inspired, and we have to read it, but especially the Psalter from the Old Testament, which is very powerful prayer. The words of Elder Arsenios are the fruit of experience. All of us who lived close to Elder Arsenios realized the simple things he taught us were not just words from the mind. They were what he had lived and applied, and that is why he shared from his abundance. When Father P. first came as a novice to Burzeri, he was confounded with thoughts. To such an extent that during vigils he was unable to say the prayer. Footnote on thoughts. It's a frightful confusion of the mind where many times prayer weakens and the soul drowns, feeling a real martyrdom. To continue, he ran to Elder Arsenios to seek help. The elder replied, Don't worry, I will pray, and tonight you won't have any thoughts. Indeed, as the brother affirmed that night, he didn't have a single thought and was amazed by the power of the elder's prayers. When it sounded that it was time for the consecrated divine liturgy, the novice ran to the, thank the elder. The elder answered with simplicity, So that's it. Tonight you sent them all to me. Another brother once found himself before an unforeseen temptation from a misunderstanding, and he was kept in a police cell for two nights. In great need, he called upon the prayers of the elder with all his heart. He said, 
Then a big flame lit inside me to such an extent that for two 24-hour periods, I didn't eat, nor drink, nor sit, nor sleep. My legs, like rods, kept me upright, and I prayed without ceasing. The brother affirmed that this was a great gift from the elder. The elder, while still alive, manifested to his children a little of what he possessed. Despite all this, when Father Arsenios compared himself to the great elder, out of humility, he considered himself to be very low. Conversations of the Elder with Pious Pilgrims Apart from the Elder's close-knit group, he was visited by many monks and also by many lay people who thirsted for a higher spiritual life and sought the Elder's blessing. When he spoke with lay people, he had a charming habit. He told them, Let me look at your hands. But why, Elder? I want to see if you are wearing a ring, meaning to see if they were married. If you are wearing a ring, we will say certain things. If you are single, we will say other things. When the visitors were interested in finding out about noetic prayer, he asked, Do you have a spiritual father? Have you been to confession? Do you pray, go to church, fast on Wednesdays and Fridays? Do you take Holy Communion frequently? If the visitors were married, he added, Do you practice abstinence? with your wives on fasts, Sundays, and great feasts? Do you have as many children as God allows? Do you love both enemies and friends? If you do that, then we will talk about noetic prayer. If not, no noetic prayer. We may as well not waste our breath. A pious student of theology who frequently came to Burazeri asked the elder the following question. Elder, how is it possible to say the prayer without ceasing, as St. Paul exhorts? Indeed, the elder was put in a difficult position. He lived that mystery himself. But how could he explain it in words so that the student, who as yet seemed uninitiated in this language, could understand it? However, to come out of this bind, the elder had to manifest himself. He said, See, my child, how can I make you understand? At this moment, my mouth is speaking. However, in my heart, the machine is constantly working. The student was amazed by the reply and thought to himself, What flame must surround this simple elder so that while he is talking, he is also simultaneously able to maintain internally unceasing prayer? The same student asked, Elder, we know that you fast very strictly. How do you cope? The elder replied very simply but wisely and in an enlightened manner, Well, it's like this. Do you have an appetite to eat and drink when you have someone dead at home? He, who asked the question, explained to me that the elder had a strong and unceasing remembrance of the saving passion inside him. This was to such an extent that the feeling of pain and the flame of love, together with the remembrance of death, weakened even this natural and incontestable appetite. The young man above, when he graduated, settled on the holy mountain where he was tonsured a monk. Today, he is the abbot of the great and holy monastery of Atopedi. Another student also came frequently to Burazeri to seek advice and to get the elder's blessing. Once he passed by and received the elder's blessing and noticed that the elder whispered something to a nearby brother. Later, out of curiosity, the student asked the brother, What did the elder whisper in your ear? He told me, You are going to Grigoryu Monastery to be a monk. The young man was astonished, because truly that was his aim. However, due to personal reasons, he kept it absolutely secret. Today, he is a hero monk and an important member of the Holy Monastery of Grigoryu. In another small gathering with lay people, a pious young man told the elder, Please, elder, I ask that you pray for me. What is your name? Andrew. I will pray for Andrew, but for my prayer to be effective, Andrew also has to care and pray for himself. St. Anthony says, I will have no mercy on you, nor will God have mercy, if you firstly don't have mercy on yourself. Meaning what, elder? Don't you understand? 
Fine, I will tell you something that happened here during my time. A pilgrim came from the desert looking for saints so they could pray for him, like you are doing now. He found an ascetic and told him, Please, elder, pray for me. I have serious problems. The ascetic felt sorry for the man and said many prayers every night in his vigil for the layman. As the ascetic was praying one night, he saw Satan outside his cell, laughing sarcastically and making fun of him. The monk asked, Why are you disturbing my peace, cursed one? Satan replied, Ha, 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 I'm laughing because you are doing useless vigils for my one, John. He is also doing vigils, but at my haunts, meaning, of course, at places of corruption. He finished his vigil a short while ago, and now he is snoring. Well, now do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, Elder, now I understand that we also have to live as Christians and try as hard as we can. Another young man asked, Elder, what should I do? When I go to the toilet, the unclean spirit attacks me. Well, you should also fight him by saying the prayer quickly and continuously. But, Elder, is it appropriate to say the prayer while in the toilet? Ah, in the necessary place, that is how Elder referred to the toilet in his correct Pontian. Who told you that it's not appropriate, said Elder Arsenius, he continued. Doesn't the apostle say, pray without ceasing? First Thessalonians 5.17 You fight, I fight. You put in a thought, I will take it out with prayer. Don't you know the example of the young man who crushed Satan through his many prayers? The evil one was in a frenzied fury because the young man was praying a lot. One day, Satan found an opportunity and appeared to the young man while he was in the toilet and said, Aren't you embarrassed saying the prayer while in the necessary place? The young man immediately said, I will say it continuously while in the necessary place, so I can take out what is necessary from my heart. Satan couldn't stand it any longer. He exploded, and it became smoke. The Elder's Humor, Amusing but Also Beneficial the elder, in conversations on a variety of topics with young people, was instructive and always jovial, so much so that often his listeners responded with uncontrollable laughter. I will say a story to you, who well and good want to get married. Once in my native Pantos, a young man from a farming family fell in love with a woman who had no idea about farming. His parents told him, she is not suitable for you. No, she is. What could they do? In the past, people would say, an old man said, now things have changed, and we say, a young man said. The group of young people laughed. You are laughing, but listen what happened later. Do you want to marry me? I do. Everything was finalized. The wedding took place. They also set up their house. The husband, being a farmer, started working. He began tilling, pruning, planting, sowing, and so on. The wife was home. The man thought to himself, I will let her get used to it. Eventually, harvesting time arrived. He asked his wife, Do you know how to harvest? Yes. Oh, good. Well, then tomorrow get ready. We'll go harvesting together. In the morning, the husband grabbed two sickles. The wife, however, got two scissors. The husband asked, What do you need those for? Aren't we going harvesting? The husband made the sign of the cross. Dear wife, we are going harvesting. Do you understand? We are not going to a barber. Yes, I understand. And she started sharpening the scissors. Leave them. They're not needed. No, they are. They're needed. No, they're not. They began quarreling. The husband then said, Well, get out of my sight and let me harvest on my own. No, I am coming too. We'll grab the sickle and we'll go. No, I will harvest with the scissors. She was so obstinate she would not give in. Oh, the work of the devil, the elder said with amazement. The husband got so angry he walked off. As he turned around he saw his wife motioning with her fingers the action of scissors. The young men laughed. You are laughing now, but watch that a similar fate does not befall you.
This is what happens to those who do as they think. Respect your parents, listen to them, and always have a spiritual father. Don't only say your sins, but also seek advice. Thankfully, by becoming monks, God has protected us from such marital difficulties. Monastic life is higher, but what can we do? Let one accept it if he is able. See Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. However, the spiritual law applies to everyone. The fathers say, an old man said, but in today's times we say, a young man said. This is what happens to those who do not listen to the old men. Elder, I have a question. They say in our village that a young woman was forced by her parents to get married against her will. The marriage failed and everyone criticizes her parents. Well, not like that. Neither marriage is to take place by force nor monasticism. There are some parents. Their mind is on riches. Advise your child. Seek what is for their good, but don't oppose it. Monasticism is, as the fathers say, the science of sciences and the art of arts. When I see young people like you, I pray inside me, enlighten them, my Christ, if it's possible for all of them to become monks. Not to oppress them, though. We advise. We throw bait like the fishermen. We do our duty, and if it catches, it catches. Each person supports their profession. Should we not barack for the noblest profession? Elder, since you admit that parents make mistakes, how should we then seek their advice? It's one matter seeking their advice and another being oppressed. Listen to your parents. Respect them. But it is safer if you also seek the advice of a good spiritual father. A spiritual father is indispensable. He forgives all sins and advises with enlightenment. He has the grace to do this. He does not put forward his own interest or advantage. He considers the immortal soul. Let's assume you want to become a monk. Does your wish oppose that of your parents? Ask your spiritual father. It may not be suitable for you. Can you imagine? He will be enlightened to respond correctly. You are thinking about marriage? The same applies. But since I can see that you are thinking along the lines of marriage, I will tell you another story, and after that we can say, Now let your servants depart. The Woman Eating in Secret and Overeating Another married woman was very gluttonous. Every morning her husband left for the fields to work while she stayed home. Her husband would say to her, Put a couple of boiled eggs in my bag for the fields. She responded, Oh, those bad old chickens, they're for slaughtering, they don't lay. But there were many. There was a whole hen coop. Her husband answered, Is it possible not even an egg? Not even an egg. Someone must steal them, it's not possible. I doubt it, it's out of the question. The stealing went on for some time and the husband became suspicious. Either my wife is sleeping during the day or she is going around the neighborhood and others are stealing from us. I will stay back to observe what's happening. One morning, he farewelled his wife, left for work, but secretly returned and hid near the hen coop. The chickens, one by one, went in to lay the eggs. Finally, the wife came and gathered them. Hey, the thief, the husband said to himself. She is selling them to build up her own savings, I will wait and see who she gives them to. In a short while, the wife heated a large fry pan and threw in all the eggs. She then took them off the fire and gluttonously ate them all. Her husband couldn't believe it. Hey, he said, how could she eat so many eggs? He thought, should I make an appearance now or should I not? As he was thinking, he heard a groan from his wife. Oh, no. What has happened to me? My stomach is aching. Oh, my abdomen. Oh, what's happening to me? Either I've become sick or I'm going to be sick. Oh, either I've become sick or I'm going to be sick. Well, her husband couldn't take it any longer. He came out of the corner where he was hiding and shouted, So that's it. You are stealing the eggs. 
Aren't you ashamed eating a whole hen coop worth of eggs on your own while your donkey of a husband works hard in the fields with only pieces of dry leftover bread? The young people listened, laughed. The elder continued, Yes, you're laughing, but don't you know what a demon gluttony is? If a person has this passion and no love, they can eat a whole banquet of food on their own and let everyone else die from hunger. A monk once did that to us. On a feast day at St. Anne, the cook, out of convenience, cooked for both the morning and the evening meals. When everyone ate after the vigil, which finished in the morning, a pot of fish was left. For the, the Kitorkika in the evening, footnote on the evening of the feast day of a monastery on the holy mountain, or of any monastic dwelling, there is an official memorial service in honor and in memory of the ever-memorable founders of the dwelling that has celebrated its feast day, followed by a meal. To continue, they were so tired that they even left the plates unwashed and went to rest. Meanwhile, we had a monk who some said was mentally unwell, while others said he was pretending to be a fool for Christ. His name was Yakovulis. Instead of Yakovulis leaving, he hid in the kitchen. When everyone left, he brought down the pot and ate everything in it. Then, as if nothing happened, without any delay, he washed all the plates and the pot. A little before mealtime, the cooks came to prepare the food and saw Yakovulis. He said to them with dispassion, stuttering a little as he was used to, I wash, wa wa washed the plates. The cook responded, Well done, Yakovos, you're hard working. The cook opened the pot. It was washed and rinsed. Hey, Yakovos, where did you put the food? I, 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 I ate it all. In the beginning, it seemed unbelievable to them, and yet he had eaten it all. Thankfully, the fathers didn't take it badly. They said that if Yakovulis managed to eat all that was in the pot, he did well to do so. The young people laughed. The elder continued, Well, what could they do with him? If he was mentally unwell, the spiritual law did not apply to him. If he was playing the fool, can you imagine? It was as if he was saying to them, Not fish twice. Isn't once enough? You are monks. The young people were laughing, but they also understood the lesson. Yerunda, what is your view about this monk? I don't know much, but can you imagine? He might be playing the fool. From the time I met him, I never saw him wearing shoes, whether it was winter or summer. As for clothing, he always wan wandered around in a torn and short cassock. And wherever he was when it was dark, there's where he stayed and slept until morning. Our elder loved him a lot. That's why he used to come to us often and eat whatever we had. He wasn't fussy with his food. Actually, he had self-restraint and ate whatever you gave him. Now, how he managed to eat a whole pot of fish, he still hasn't told us the secret. The elder finished with these charming and pleasant words and dismissed the youths with his usual seal, Go with Christ's blessing. The guardian angel goes before you. The Wild Swallow on the Elder's Shoulders There are some wild swallows that build their nests on the very high external walls of the monasteries. However, they are so wild that when they see a human being, they fly like aeroplanes and leave. And yet, while the Elder was once praying on the balcony, a swallow approached and sat on his shoulders. The Elder recounted, I said, Has the Evil One sent you to stop me from saying the prayer? I turned my head and looked at it. It looked at me. I resumed saying the prayer. In a short while, I turned again and looked at the bird. The bird also looked at me. I said, this isn't right. I thought of sending it away, but felt sorry for it. Oh, I said to the bird, you have understood me. The elder won't harm you. Well, sit as long as you like, but under one condition, don't leave on my shoulders any droplings. The elder told us this with simplicity to entertain us. However, a certain brother mentioned the following to me. When a person with the cooperation of grace rediscovers the state of Adam before the fall, 
The animals recognize this state and run to him like they used to do with Adam. This has happened to many saints. It seems that the elder's pure prayer drew and greatly pacified this wild bird. The monk who was troubled by the demon. A certain brother, somewhat shaken, ran to the elder. Yanon to help me. What's wrong, my child? You look very shaken. Well, elder, the tempter doesn't leave me alone, not only when I am sleeping, but also while I am awake. During sleep, there are screams, threats. It's the same during the vigil. When I begin my prayer rule, it knocks on my door and I hear wild screams and threats. Out of fright, I am shaking like a fish. I don't know where to go to escape. Oh, you are a great struggler. Satan has understood you and is laughing. When we say, Kyrie Yesu Christe, Eleis on me, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. The evil one burns hearing the name of Christ. The devil comes up with all kinds of means to make us be quiet. He pounds us with thoughts, ideas, distractions, whatever else you can imagine, so that we don't say the prayer. He found you to be timid. He's telling you, either stop saying the prayer or else I will come inside and kill you. You fell for it. Don't be afraid of him. He is a liar. He can't even touch a hair if he doesn't have permission from above. God is allowing him to train you. My elder and I did even higher training. We were even hit by the cursed one. However, we weren't timid like you. When the evil one came, we said the prayer with all our heart. We gave ourselves completely to God. The prayer was said quickly, but it was also pure. Our mind glued itself to the meaning of the prayer. We attached ourselves to the prayer, to our Christ. Peace, joy, tears came inside us. Then the devil became invisible. We even thanked him. I will also tell you what happened once to Father Ephraim Katanakiotis. In the first years that we met him, he struggled in prayer with a lot of zeal. One night, he lay down on the bed to rest a little before getting up for the vigil. The demons had a lot of malicious envy against him. Father Ephraim's prayer was fire. A whole legion came outside his cell and began screaming. The monk awoke. He was frightened. He listened and realized they were demons. With one voice they were screaming, War! War! They thought he would be terrified like you, but what did the monk do? He got up from the bed as quick as a flash of lightning. He grabbed the three hundred not komboskini and answered loudly with courage, Yes, yes, war. And the warfare began. Kyrie Isu Christe, Aleis on me. Kyrie Isu Christe, Aleis on me. He had such a vigil that he remembered it for years. He later also thanked the demons for waking him. Do you hear how they struggle? Well, go with my blessing and next time do the same if you want to progress. Fear God, not Satan. Not only was the vine crooked, but one night, as an inexperienced monk was keeping vigil, he was crushed by the demon of negligence. He had a heavy head, headaches, felt weary, was yawning, and sleepy. It was a real struggle to complete his necessary monastic duties. In the morning, he thought of confessing to Elder Arsenios his achievements so that the elder could help him. But temptation again got in the way. He thought to himself while walking, Oh, how shameful! Before he spoke to the elder, the elder said first, Oh, this is a shame. God put shame in people so that they don't sin, and the devil put shame in people so that they don't confess but are destroyed. The brother took courage with this insight and said, Elder, last night the vigil didn't go well. Well, that is the result of the day's achievements. Meaning, don't you understand? Some disobedience, some backtalking, condemnation, negligence, and so on. The night also requires liveliness. We, that is elders Yosef and Arsenios, held a stick under our arms. Negligence came, we did prostrations. Negligence came again, there were beatings. We prayed all night standing. This is how we learned to keep vigil. 
We are either going to live or die. Elder, other times I was able to stand most of the night and the prayer went like clockwork. The truth is that I was a little self-willed yesterday. Also, some negligence crept in my work. But in the evening, I also had a sore head. I felt weary. I couldn't stand. I sat for a bit. Then I began to fall asleep. Again, there was a feeling of being heavy. My knees buckled. I was overcome with sleep. In a few words, the elder said, a bit of everything. I am a bit sick and a little lazy. I was slightly disobedient. I also criticized. What else? Well, let's better say, the Greek adage, not only was the vine crooked, but the donkey ate it. Anyway, make a start and don't be afraid. Go, and tonight I will be with you. Go with my blessing. Your angel goes before you. Elder Arsenio supported us with these graceful words, but also with the power of his own prayer. He never discouraged us. The recluse Yosef takes communion by the hand of an angel and, more difficult struggles, the apples of the Theotokos. Elder Arsenio said that one of the great elder's spiritual struggles was to confine himself in a cave for a long time without coming out at all. Elder Arsenio said, Because I didn't have such a high spiritual state, I served him by providing what was necessary. Elder Arsenios continued, During a major feast, Elder Yosef had such a strong desire to partake of the holy mysteries that his tears turned the ground to mud, and he berated himself as unworthy of the body and blood of our Savior. While in that state of great compunction, the dark cave suddenly lit up with heavenly light. He lifted his eyes. What did he see? A heavenly angel holding in his hands a spoon with the body and blood of our Master. The angel whispered, The body and blood of Christ, Monk Yosef, the servant of God, takes communion. The angel gave him communion and disappeared. But did Elder Arsenios perhaps lack the mindset for struggle? Father Arsenios said, quote, I heard that many saints wore hair shirts directly on their bodies, and I tried to do the same. But what can I say? I couldn't do it. My whole body filled with wounds. It pierced me like nails. I lasted for about a year. Then I took it off. But one can ask, who can cope with these thick hairs piercing you like nails? Those two great ascetics in the realm of their youthful and intense struggles never turned on a heater to warm themselves during the winter, wintry frozen night breezes under the summit of Athos. Actually, they frequently traveled along the frozen icy road. They would climb up the road to reach their beloved chapel of Panagia, where they stayed overnight praying. Elder Arseni related, Once, when climbing up the frozen pathway during winter, we had almost reached the chapel. We didn't know whether it was demonic or a trial from Panagia to test us, but we found ourselves in such a thick fog that we couldn't see one step ahead of us. The elder said to me, Father Arseni, the places up here are dangerous. We might fall over a cliff. It's better to stay here overnight. It's the same thing. What can I say? We had such a great vigil that I will never forget it. When the light shone in the morning, what did we see? We were right outside Panagia's chapel. This was also a gift from our Panagia. Yes, and what did our good mother provide for us another time when we were exhausted after a grueling climb at night? As we walked inside the church, it was filled with the fragrance of two freshly cut apples that were placed right in front of her icon. The elder, who was more courageous, said, Father Arsenios, we are going to eat these apples and do a prayer rope for whoever dedicated them. He left them for us because we need them. They were so sweet that when we ate them, we said they were heavenly. Then it made sense, and we looked at each other. What season is it now, Father Arsenios? It was about the end of February. Where did such fresh apples come from in this season? We immediately fell down in front of the icon with tears and were thankful for the heavenly gift from our Panagia, who looked after us like a compassionate mother. There were no refrigerators back then. That's why there is no doubt that it was a heavenly gift from our Panagia. 
Eurasimus Menangias. We asked the elder if other monks came to stay with them. Many came and were benefited by our elder, but they couldn't stay and live like us. Once, a very educated person called Menangias, he is the renowned, learned monk Gerasimos Menangias. He asked to stay with us for a short while because he had a great need. The elder told him to stay for as long as he wanted, as long as he was obedient. The man was carrying a small bag with him. The elder asked, What's in there? Medication, elder. That's why I came to you. Perhaps you can make me well. I will make you well on one condition. You will empty this bag down the slope and eat whatever we eat once a day. But yet and if I throw away the medication, I'm lost. That is what sustains me. As for food, I am obliged because of my illness to frequently eat small amounts. Very well, as you please. In the evening, the elder told him, Well, my child, go somewhere else in the morning with my blessing. But, elder, I came to you to make me well. I told you, if you're going to stay here, I want two things. Throw away the medication and eat once a day. But, elder, I can't do that. Leave. I can't. He wouldn't leave and he wouldn't listen until God pitied him. And he heard a loud voice inside him, Why don't you listen to the elder? Then finally, he threw away the medication and ate with us. The next day he came to the elder with joy and said, I don't have enough words to thank you. All the illnesses have gone, and I feel like a child. He had seven major illnesses. But what happened later? He came one day and said, Elder, one of the seven illnesses has returned. I want you to confess your thoughts. Well, elder, yesterday I had a thought of disbelief. Like, he made you throw away the medication if you get sick again. Where are you going to find more medication in the desert? That's it, replied the elder. That is why the illness returned. Make me well, elder, and I promise that I will be careful in the future. It's enough that you have been healed of the six illnesses. This one you will keep, so you will be careful, and to carry a small cross. Ephraim the Fat One After Father John the Vlach, which we previously mentioned, another pious young man stayed with us, called Ephraim, said Elder Arsenios. Because he was also slightly large, we used to call him Ephraim the Fat One. He was a very good monk. He was a struggler, obedient, and so on. Actually, he relieved me somewhat because he had a strong constitution. However, while going down to the wharf to bring things, he heard some gossip that other disciples were given permission to leave the holy mountain for a few days. Having been incited, he came to the elder and pleaded to be given leave for a week. During his prayer, the elder was perceptibly informed, don't send Father Ephraim out because he will never return. Father Ephraim insisted, everybody leaves and returns. Am I going to be the only one to stay? The elder told him, I have said and spoken, and I take no responsibility. No, Yeranda, I will return. He left, and he is yet to return. He even reached America. After Elder Yosef departed for the heavenly realms, Father Ephraim, near the end of his life, visited us at Burzeri. He shed bitter tears before us and berated himself as disobedient. He actually said, I saw my elder frequently, even while in America. He would embrace me and plead with me, saying, Come, my child, I am waiting for you. And yet, I didn't listen. Footnote. In the book Monastic Wisdom, there are exhort exhortive letters to the above disciple. Actually, in the 60th letter, Elder Yosef writes to his this disciple, among other things, Quote, even now, see to it that you come. To continue, Father Arsenios continued, These are examples so that we, and especially the young, do not become confident in ourselves. He would have been the successor of our brotherhood if he listened to the elder. However, there's even worse. At least he stayed with the cassock. I know many that have been deceived and have left, and in the end they soiled their schema with sins or got tied up in the bonds of marriage. 
and two amazing instances of return. Father Arsenios related, We have some exceptions of monks who returned with great repentance. One such instance was that of our elder, Ephraim the barrel maker. When he became a monk, he had no idea how to battle with the powers and rulers of darkness. However, he was well-intentioned. Earlier, hearing that an uncle of his was a monk, had kindled in his heart the desire to follow the same path. So one day he reached the hut of the Annunciation at Katanakia near his uncle, Elder Yosif. Important note, Elder Joseph, the cave dweller, Saint Yosif, was given this name by Elder Ephraim as a, a sign of respect to this elder. To continue, however, since the evil one saw another young man arming himself and wearing black, what did he do? He aroused the carnal passions with much severity. The young man lost it. He said, Now what shall I do? Things are difficult. Unfortunately, his elder had not yet taught him about the snares of the enemy, and the cure was confession. However, having good intentions, the ignorant young man ran to the icon of the Annunciation. He said to our Panagia, like a small child, to his mother, My Panagia, as I can see, things are difficult. That's why I thought, if you could allow me to go out into the world for a short while, I'll get married so that the carnal warfare passes, and I promise that I will return. The next day he greeted his uncle and said, I have to go, but I will return. So he left and found a woman to marry. But the young man wanted to be up front from the beginning. He told her, I plan to marry only for a short while, and then I'm going to become a monk. Do you agree? The woman took it lightly. Surely you're joking, she thought. The wedding took place, and in a year they had a child. There was joy, a christening, and so on. Then the young man sat and thought, There's one child in one year. If I stay longer, there will be a second and third. And then there goes monasticism. I will be tied up for good. He called his wife and told her, Remember what we had agreed upon before getting married? Well, the marriage has ended. Tomorrow I leave to become a monk. The woman was dumbfounded. There were screams and tears. You don't feel sorry for me? But what about this poor child? Who's going to look after it? The young man weighed up this serious venture and thought of entrusting the issue to Panagia. He said in front of her icon, Panagia, I have not revoked on my promise, but I have got caught up because, apart from my wife, I also have a child to protect. The only solution is for you to convince my wife that if I leave, you will undertake to protect the child. Indeed, the young man's prayer was heard. However, Panagia found another solution. As the child was pure, like an angel after the christening, Panagia took the child's innocent soul to rejoice permanently in the heavenly kingdom. Naturally, both parents were saddened by the child's death. Nevertheless, a few days after the funeral, the husband came back to the same issue. It's sad, my dear, that we have lost our little angel. However, I think it's time for me to depart and fulfill my purpose, because if God grants us another child, then you will rightly impede me again. The woman was unyielding. If you leave, who will look after me? Ah, uh, don't worry about that. I will pray, and Panagia will take you under her charge. Panagia will take me under her charge? At the mention of Panagia, she thought to herself, I'm not going to be able to prevail over him. If I hinder his purpose, who knows if I will end up like my child. She called him the next day and said, I don't want to be on bad terms with Panagia. Since she wants you near her, leave tomorrow morning and pray, as you promised, for Panagia to take me under her charge. In the morning, she prepared his things and let him go freely. He swiftly arrived at Katonakia and went to his uncle. Having learned how to repel the demonic attacks, he remained to the end of his life as an example of virtue. We were counted worthy to be disciples of this elder until his end and to get his holy blessing, said Father Arsenios. He continued, 
Another elder at the Holy Monastery of Grigoriu was persuaded when he was a young monk by the love of his mother to go out into the world for a short while. There he fell into a trap that she set, and he got tied by the bonds of marriage. He also had a small boy who, with his innocent eyes, could see on his father's chest the red cross of the angelic schema. The father, who knew what it meant, could no longer cope with the reproof of his conscience. He returned to his monastery, and from then on was an example to all the brotherhood with his repentance. God showed that he accepted the monk's repentance when shortly after he passed away, we learned that myrrh was secreted from his body. This was monk Makarios Gregoriatis, who passed away in 1975. I also met other similar exceptions. However, most monks who leave are swallowed up in the world. That's why I say these things, so that we are very careful. About an ascetic who was a gem. Elder Arsenios related, Once I heard about a renowned ascetic and got the blessing to meet him. This precious gem lived in the highest hut, a little further down from the summit of Athos. As if the frightful cold of winter wasn't enough, lightning constantly struck that place and many times singed his clothes. Jealous of his great self-denial, I asked him, Elder, can I stay here too? That experienced fighter replied, You can, my child, if you have continual tears. But why didn't Elder Arsenio stay? Didn't he have tears? From what I had mentioned previously, was his struggle any easier? And how was he supported if he wasn't nourished by the daily showering of tears, which he often recommended, saying, Struggle to acquire sweet tears. It's a sweet direct from paradise. The reason that Elder Arsenios didn't stay was simple. He still continued to be under obedience to the great elder, whom he promised that they would only be separated by death. The Spiritual Father, Elder Euthemios Numbered among the many leading figures during the time of Elder Arsenios is the ever-memorable spiritual father, Elder Euthemios. He was a great struggler, as Elder Arsenios used to say. Indeed, he came up with the thought of wearing a singlet saturated in hot wax. The wax had hardened on the singlet and had become like lino. That is what he wore, winter or summer. He lived at the Cathisma of St. Athanasios of the Monastery of the Great Lavra and was a renowned spiritual father throughout the Holy Mountain. On Sundays and feast days, many monks from the desert and the cells of the Lavra went to the monastery. After the church service, which lasted many hours, there was always a meal for the visitors. They ate, drank, rested for a while, and then walked back to their cells. It was an opportunity on their return to go past the spiritual father and say some thoughts. They knocked on the door with the known words, through the prayers of our holy fathers. The spiritual father's deep voice could be heard inside, answering, Amin, and they entered. Welcome. What do you want? Holy spiritual father, if it's blessed, may we say some thoughts that are troubling us? Tell me the truth. Did you eat? Yes. Drink? Yes. Rested? Yes. Oh, good work. Well then, the spiritual father may as well eat first, drink, and then we will say some spiritual things. The spiritual father used to say this humorously, but he knew to whom he said it. It was like he was parabolically saying, they first go to the spiritual father and take care of the soul, and then take care of the stomach. 